Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Better Love and Sex. I am your host, Davey Ward, and I thank you once again for joining me this evening for another succulent discussion where we explore ever more ways to awaken, heal, and transform our sexuality, and most importantly, I think, our relationship to our sexuality, so that we can have more love, both for ourselves and others, more sex, and, you know, more pleasure in general in every area of our life, discussing the, the four different forms of pleasure, which are physical, emotional, spiritual, and sexual, and the penultimate human experience is to have all four forms of those pleasure happening at once, fully integrated. This evening, I'm really, really honored and very excited to have uh, my guest, Dr. Mitchell Tepper. I And Dr. Mitchell Tepper is an internationally recognized expert on sexuality and disabilities. Ever since becoming paralyzed at age 20, he has dedicated his life to helping others take pleasure in their sexuality in the face of serious injury or illness. Dr. Tepper is a self-proclaimed prophet of pleasure, and his research has focused on pleasure and orgasm in people with spinal cord injuries. And I wanted to share with you all that the one of the reasons that I reached out to Dr. Tepper to be on the show is an associate of mine a couple of years ago, I was having a, a Tantra workshop in Vancouver, and an associate of mine is married to a, a partner who uh, is disabled. And she was expressing some frustration and some disappointment about the fact that that um, sex for people with disabilities is, and workshops and information about how to go about having sex for people with disabilities is not, doesn't seem to be very readily available. And in doing some research, I had to agree there aren't a whole lot of people talking openly about sex and eroticism for people with serious injuries or disabilities. And I just think it's such an important subject, such an important topic, because there are so many people out there with some form of disability or injury and, uh, and pleasure is an important part of our human experience. And so having information, having access to tools to help us cultivate pleasure, no matter what state of body we are in, is, is essential to our well-being. So I'm very honored uh, to have you here with me this evening, Dr. Tepper, and thank you so much. Thank you, David. You had me uh, smiling already at succulent. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. I love it. And so, so to, I want to give a little bit more more background for for do, for the audience. Um, so, Dr. Tepper has been on CNN, the Discovery Channel, PBS, Huffington Post Live, New York Times, Chicago Tribune, USA Today. So he's truly, truly gracing us this evening with this with this very learned presence. So I very much appreciate it. Um, and I guess you know the question is, for me. Is is what led you to to your studies to exploring sensuality and sexuality for people with disabilities and becoming such you know the leading expert in that field? Well, it's 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 very personal for me. I, I literally uh, dove head first into this uh, line of work. I was uh, twenty years old, uh, working as a lifeguard. I grew up with something called Crohn's disease. Some people might be familiar with colitis, but it's it's a, a form of, uh, of inflammatory bowel disease. And I had left college. I was uh, in my junior year, left college uh, for emergency surgery. And that led to a second surgery and eventually getting uh, what's called an ileostomy or, or a bag that was on my side. Mm -hmm. So I, I had that bag um, and when I talked to the doctor, my surgeon, when I was getting released, he said, don't let that thing keep you doing from whatever you want to do. I'm like, well, I want my job back as a lifeguard. And so he signed my paperwork. And, you know, when it was about six weeks post-surgery and I got back into shape, I went back to work. And it was really like one of my first weekends back. And I, you know, had this habit of emptying the bag and putting my suit over it so, so no one would see it. And it was near the end of a very nice day, and I really was just running in the water uh, and diving in to fix a buoy. It was nothing heroic. It uh, wasn't saving any lives. Uh, and I dove over uh, a, a line or a rope that separated the deeper part of the, the water. And as I did that, instead of flipping, as I usually would do, I, I hit my head on the bottom. And just, uh, you know, heard a pssst and, uh, you know, floated to the top and, 
uh, a fellow lifeguard asked me if I was okay, and I said no. And that led uh, me to um, being in the hospital, uh, waking up, you know, after having uh, some surgery on my neck, rebuilding my neck. Uh, and one of the first questions to my doctors was, you know, will I ever be able to have children again? And uh, he said, you know, just well, statistically, you know, your chances are pretty low. You know, less than 10% of people with spinal cord injuries ever have have children. And and that started my <laughs> my journey. I'm like, uh, no way. <laughs> mm-hmm. So uh, this this was very very personal for me how I, how I got into this. So you were 20 years old and you had a spinal cord injury and your doctor saying, you know, no, pretty much life is over. You're not going to have kids. And so I'm guessing, I don't know a whole lot about spinal cord injury. So I'm guessing that one of the main functions that's affected is your erectile function. Well, not exactly. Uh, It really depends on your level and completeness of injury. So when I'm teaching about sexuality, I teach about all aspects. So it in in my case, what was confusing to me is that I had an erection all the time, you know. So I woke up with with an erection, which I couldn't quite feel, but I sensed. Uh, I had an indwelling catheter. So if anyone who's been in the hospital, even to have a baby, often they put a, a catheter in you. And uh, for me, on my level of injury, stimulation, direct stimulation, would cause what we call a reflex erection. So you would get erections from this thing being in you. You would get erections when they stretched you uh, um, and, you know, when the sheets moved over you. So in the case of someone with uh, a high level of injury, uh, they may get a lot of reflex erections, but they may not necessarily last. So when somebody goes home and they may be in in the situation where they want to have intercourse, um, they may lose that erection. So in my case, I got an erection, but I I wasn't able to ejaculate. Um, and so that the the ability to ejaculate uh, is is impaired more so than to get erection. Now people may or may not feel that erection. I'm incomplete, so I had some sensation uh, and more as I, as as the months and years went on, but. You know, at the time of injury, it was it was just more of a sense versus a sensation. So, so yeah. So people's um, rectal function or their lubrication uh, will vary, and we don't have time to get into the, the great details based on their their level and completeness of injury. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you did have some erectile rectal function, but it sounds like it was more it was more of a reflex as opposed to like a pleasure stimulated through pleasure and arousal. Right, and I, I, you know, I'm, uh, I'm an incomplete quad, but at the time I couldn't really use my hands, uh, so I, you know, I say I took things into my own hands. I, I actually attempted to, to masturbate to see if I could ejaculate while I was still in the hospital, um, probably right out of intensive care, you know, just kind of putting my palms together and seeing if it would work, because that's what I want to know is. Is this still going to work? So it was. It was pretty. I was pretty focused on this this area of my life, and I wasn't happy with the doctor's response because I didn't understand why why I had this erection, but I couldn't ejaculate. And mm-hmm. and you know they also were telling me I was never going to walk again and or, or move, and I felt like I had some sensation in my toe. So I, I just didn't believe him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you weren't satisfied with their answers, and so you. So so then, what happened next? How did you? How did you then become the prophet of pleasure that you are today? Well, then my research started. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's it started in the hospital by trying to get my private dirty nurse to help me. <laughs> uh, it continued when I got transferred to a rehab hospital in New York, where I had a, a relationship with my roommate's sister. Um, you know, I, I would seek out experiences. I would read, uh, you know, anything I could get my hands on. Uh, and, uh, you know, there was a lot of, like, good role models. Uh, well, I guess I'm going to use a guy's first and last name. It's, we're talking about 32 years ago. Um, this guy came back in as, a, as a, for a skin issue. Uh, Danny Stetner, I remember him so clearly. And, uh, you know, he was a paraplegic and he showed me a picture of his girlfriend, and she was gorgeous, and she was standing there in a, a like a kimono, open, 
you know, like with her, her breast exposed. And, and at that time, people still had pubic hair. So it was full <laughs> frontal. And so there were breasts and pubic hairs, and she was gorgeous. And this guy was in a wheelchair. And all, you know, I wasn't a sexologist. But I was in, 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 in Bryan College. I was working on a degree in finance when I broke my neck. So uh, all I could say was, she let you take this picture? I mean, this was in 1982. I mean, we we're talking Polaroid. We're not talking digital and sexting, you know. So this was... Like, wow. First, it was she let you take that picture. And second, it was like, wow, that's your girlfriend. Uh, and so, you know, I saw role models to other people who had had had, had been in relationships. And, uh, and so I, I kept seeking that out myself. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you were inspired to have sex with gorgeous women. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Not necessarily uh, uh, gorgeous, but just nice women. Nice um, women. <laughs> yeah, and so you know, I, I I did then, you know, get involved with the National Spinal Cord Injury Association, and and at those conferences, there would always be, and this was a yearly conference, a workshop on sexuality, and I went there, and once again, there were other people who were much more experienced than me, uh, giving basically one hour workshops, which once again that gave me some more information and some more hope. Mm. Uh, and so I, you know, I just took it to a, a different level, <laughs> ending up as a as a sex doctor. Because, you know, although I I finished uh, summa cum laude with a degree in business and finance, uh, that wasn't satisfying for me. You know, I went into banking and and it was wasn't doing it. And I eventually moved my career and my dreams from going over to Wall Street to to working on a PhD in human sexuality education because I felt it was my calling. And why the profit and pleasure is because it was my calling and I did it even though I didn't get paid for it for many, many years. <laughs> so I was just spreading the word, you know, of, of, of pleasure. And, and I chose to focus on, on pleasure uh, in this area because in the area of sexual health in, this, in, in the middle of the 90s, people just thought of HIV and disease, you know. And and you know really there was there was the danger of sex and and unwanted uh, or unplanned pregnancies. Uh, I wanted to be I wanted to be in a place where I could help people you know their sense of sexuality as a source of pleasure in their life and not a source of pain. So in the, in my personal situation, you know, um, I wasn't really interested, in, although I asked about having children, that wasn't my focus. I was still in college. I was a junior. I wasn't really dating anyone seriously. Uh, but that was the way I could ask the question. But what what would I really, you know, ask me? Of course, I was wondering if I could ever have children. But as I said, that wasn't an immediate concern the day before I broke my neck, but I wanted to know if I could still have sex. Can I still enjoy this? Can I still, you know, meet somebody? Um, so these, these things were important to me. And, you know, as I, as I learned the answers to all those were, were positive, I wanted to share that with other people. So I wanted to focus on helping people to optimize their sexual pleasure. And once again, I was saying that so, so that their sexuality and sexual life would be a source of, of pleasure for them and not a source for pain because when sexuality is not addressed, you know, after serious illness or injury, there are, you know, nine out of ten times there are, are negative consequences and, and, and people suffer in silence. So, you know, uh, in 1996, I had started a website, sexualhealth.com, and the mission was ending the silence around uh, sexual health and disabilities and chronic conditions. You know, at a click of the mouse in 1996 was, was also novel. So, so what are some of the myths in people's heads after experiencing some serious injury or illness? So what are some of these myths that you wanted to dispel through this website? Yeah, well, I mean, a lot of this stuff came up out of, out of my research. You know, so I, I, I was involved in first laboratory research at Rutgers with doctors Beverly Whipple and Barry Komisarek. So... Beverly Whipple is known as the, the G-Spot lady mm-hmm. in that lab where they did the work um, that led to the, the, the rediscovery of, of, of the G-Spot and, and laboratory work. A lot of the work that you see on, on brain uh, scans and, and fMRIs uh, happened in that lab. So they were doing research with women with spinal cord injuries uh, and you know, I asked if I could join their team. Now, they were doing this physiologically-based research that was trying to understand um, the input of the 
genital stimulation on orgasm and also input on stimulation of areas above the injury. So, for example, someone who would experience uh, orgasm through nipple stimulation or through through kissing. So they were they were looking to understand the different nerves that innovated uh, the genital system and also contributed to to orgasm. And you know, I was working on a PhD in sexuality education. So, you know, coming from a degree in business and in public health, you know, I didn't know much about this this fundamental, you know, physiological research. But I had questions uh, as that I came to to have by both having a person with a disability and, and knowing other people is like, like, why is it that one woman, in this case one woman, uh, with a spinal cord injury uh, identical to the other woman, one woman experiences orgasm and the other doesn't? You know, so that led to my dissertation research over the years of, of interviewing many, many people who self-proclaimed either having an orgasm or not uh, and, and digging into that and finding out, you know, what were the differences of, of the people because it wasn't the level or completeness of injury. Before I said the erectile function or the lubrication, uh, the ability to move and feel are directly related to level and completeness of injury, but orgasm is this kind of independent phenomenon. And so I was digging into the question about sexuality before and after injury. And, and there's first, you know, there are some common themes that emerge and from those themes come come the, the myths in their heads. So, you know, I wanted to know about how people learned about sex before injury. And, you know, as you and I know and how we learn now, it's mostly haphazardly, you know, through friends, uh, through porn, through women's magazines, uh, there's not much structured education in our, at least in, in the United States, in our school system, uh, and they're not getting information uh, from the clergy or even from the hospitals after after injury. So I, I ask people, tell me about your sexuality after injury, and they would say, you know, across the board, it's not the same mm-hmm. or it's not normal. You know, I, w- I was expecting them to say, oh, I could get an erection, but I can't ejaculate, or I can't even feel, but everyone... Men and women said it's not the same. It's not normal. Um, and then they had what I call the lived experience, okay, or an embodied experience. And one of those first experiences for almost everybody, men and women, was masturbation. Mm. And that experience of masturbation, which often is prescribed, it's even prescribed in a video about sex and spinal cord injury, uh, is sometimes and often was a very negative experience for people. You know, and so they would touch themselves, and it wasn't the same. It wasn't normal. And what is the same, and what is normal for people is what's the same or, the, or normal before they broke their neck, or before they got a brain injury, or before they had, you know, a prostate uh, surgery or hysterectomy. So, you know, our our what's normal for us is what's normal the day before uh, right. an event. And so this experience of masturbation led to this. Pointless, why bother? Uh, and I, so I said, well, tell me what you were thinking about um, when you when you attempted to stimulate yourself. And they were like, I was wondering if it still worked. I was thinking that this still doesn't feel the same. So they had these distracting thoughts. No one said, oh, I was aroused and I reached down and I tried, to, you know. There was, they were doing something and they said it was mechanical and they were just trying to figure things out. And so then people would have an experience sometimes with their spouse or a partner that was negative and that bad partner experience led to it's pointless why bother mm. so these quote unquote lived experiences you know reified a, they, they solidified their fantasy and this is one of the myths that I'm not the same I'm not normal therefore my sex life is over so right. that's one of the biggest myths that, that people are holding on to and it's it's based on uh, it's based on, on somewhat their reality at a moment in time uh, without education, you know. So it's, it's you know, true. So if, if you know, for them, that's, that's what they knew. So if the sensation was gone or if the escalation of arousal was gone or ejaculation was gone, they have no feeling, therefore my sex life is over. And, mm-hmm. and it goes 
on if I'm not experiencing pleasure or if I'm not experiencing orgasm anymore, then it's pointless. Why bother? You know? Um, so then another myth is also based on this reality. My partner left me. My mm-hmm. partner cheated on me. My partner avoided having sex with me. So I'm not lovable. I'm not capable of being a partner. And so it's pointless. Why bother? So those are like three huge myths. No feeling, therefore my sex life is over. I'm not experiencing pleasure and orgasm, so it's pointless. My partner doesn't care about me, you know, sexually, so it's pointless. Why bother? Uh, The next biggest myth um, is one uh, perpetuated more by the healthcare industry. Uh, Just give it time and everything will fall into place. So because doctors aren't trained and other health professionals aren't trained in the provision of sexual health care or to tell people what's going to happen, they say just give it time. And some people in my research, uh, you know, their first experience of, of orgasm was 10, 15, 20 years after their injury. Wow. You know, other people never got there. Wow. So you know, what does it mean to just give it time? Yeah. So, so give it time with absolutely no education, no instruction. So, so what do you, what about those people who, um, you know, they recover from their injury to, to the degree that they can and they feel no pleasure and they feel no orgasm or they, they don't have orgasm, but most importantly, they're not experiencing pleasure. So what, what is, how do you address that? So, you know, everybody in this, in, in my research had lost, they had the experience of orgasm before and lost it. Right, and then many people regained it over time. So I asked everybody about, tell me about a peak sexual experience, whether it included orgasm or not. So everyone gets asked this question. And for people's peak sexual experience, two things that were very important: they were with a trusted partner, and sometimes that was someone else in rehab uh, that they felt very comfortable with. So often it was another person with a disability, so they didn't have to explain themselves and they felt safety. So this context is important. So when people were in a relationship, it didn't have to be long-term, but they were in a relationship in the context where they were with a trusted partner and they felt safe, not just physically safe, but I'm talking about emotional safety. Then they were able to feel this, what they called connectedness, you know? And so this this whole concept of connectedness uh, is, you know, I mean, it's what... What, what you're about when you work with Tantra and, with, with, and, and I incorporate that into all my, my, my workshops, you know, uh, is that, you know, what we call desire, uh, much of it is a, a yearning for connection, yes. right? So when you're with a partner and that you, it's a trusted partner and it's, it's, you're feeling safe, uh, people begin to experience uh, their pleasure in pleasing another. So often, and this may be more gender focus for, for men, um, but maybe not. Um, people are measuring their pleasure by their own experience, right? And so when people, and in, in the area of, of spinal cord injury, more men are injured than women, but uh, what, what people uh, begin to do is focus in, focus in on, when you're focusing on your own pleasure, you begin to just focus in on your losses. I can't feel it. It's not the same, you know? But when you're with somebody who who cares for you and you and you trust and you want to please them, people found that they were experiencing great pleasure in pleasing somebody else. Mm-hmm. No longer the was on just themselves. And through this pleasing of others, some of them experienced you know orgasmic sensations. So the the experience in pleasing and, and they said sex was more an expression of love. No word that we don't hear a lot in relationship to sex, but you talked about, you know, bringing all the emotional, spiritual, and sexual, and I think it's in the, the realm of the spiritual that we connect with people on this level and that we love, right? Um, that's not something that's, quote, unquote, physical or, uh, you know. And it's so, energetic. Yeah, it's, it's energetic. Energetic, and you know, maybe it was in your intro- introduction, but, I mean, I, I talk about, uh, the Western model and the Eastern model. So I talk about the Western friction model of sex. So we learned that if you apply the appropriate amount of friction to the right part, so if you rub the clitoris for long enough, uh, that you're going to get the response, right, uh, of orgasm. 
So that's what I call a friction model of sex versus the energetic model of sex uh, doesn't even require connection or rubbing of the genitals. You know, so if you're practiced uh, in, in, in tantric techniques, and, and you know, I, I, I want to give some credit to uh, Ray Stubbs from one of his books is The Essential Tantra, but, but Ray Stubbs is someone who, who developed a lot of work around massage and around and touch and around tantra. And uh, he also experienced a spinal cord injury many years ago, and that's that's how we got connected. And we began to share things. And I wanted to incorporate his work into my workshops. And, mm-hmm. and he boiled down this into three things, uh, you know, at least to get started. And, 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 you know, I've got some videos. They call it Tantra, Stop, Focus, and Connect. So whether you have a disability or not, you know, this ability to kind of slow down, be in the moment uh, to relax and to focus in on what's happening on yourself and what's also on your partner in a partner situation uh, is the context in which we can then open up to experience all kinds of pleasure. And these, like you said, could be energetic. And, you know, for me, you know, I'm working on putting my work into a more accessible format for people in a book, which I'm calling Redefining Orgasm. Mm-hmm. So, so traditionally, we have defined orgasm as these muscular contractions in the genitals that result in, you know, um, ejaculation in men and, and just, uh, you know, relaxation in women. And it was a very genitally focused uh, definition. But our research in the laboratory and looking at brain research and, you know, Doctors Whipple and Komisarik also did the research on women who have orgasm through fantasy alone. All leads us to looking at a, a, a both the neurophysiological definition of orgasm that's more centered in the brain, uh, but the research in spinal cord injury leads us to go even farther when we see that one person can and one can't, and it's this concept of connectiveness uh, that led them on their way to pleasure and even orgasm. So we go really into this, the spiritual realm, into the transcendent realm, uh, into the work that you specialize in, uh, in, in Tantra, and, and also in, in, in the importance of touch. So people and, often experience their first orgasm by surprise. Mm-hmm. And, and the importance, what I'm hearing is the importance of connection. It's like connection is the magic glue that holds life together and and that allows for these these experiences of pleasure and orgasm to arise and you're speaking specifically for you know with people with disabilities and and what i'm hearing though in my in the work that i do i hear how profound connection is for all of us regardless it's like for us as women we need this sense of we need a container of safety and trust in order to fully let go and and experience our full orgasmic potential and for many men who may suffer from erectile dysfunction you know that isn't physiologically based but that's emotionally based they really need to be in this container of safety and trust and where they can be authentic about what's going on for them and and i know people around the world that i've talked with Everyone agrees that the most, like you said, the peak sexual experiences, the most enriching, fulfilling, nourishing sexual experiences are usually the ones when we feel the most connected to the person that we're having sex with or people that we're having sex with when we feel the most held, the most nurtured, the most loved, the most adored, the most uh, celebrated. That's when we have these epic sexual experiences. So I, I just, what you're saying correlates, I think, no matter where we are, whether we have disabilities or not, I think it's just the hu- what the human experience. It's essential. Yeah. 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 So this is, this is research that was grounded in spinal cord injury, which is a good, you know, a model for experimentation because you lose sensation in the women's yes. complete injuries. You lose movement, you know, and so then there's, an, you know, problems with psychological issues and, and body image. And so you have, and there's bowel and bladder issues. So you have all these different things that could happen from a stroke, could happen from diabetes, could happen from multiple sclerosis, could happen from, you know, um, amputation. So it, it touches on so many different aspects. So from spinal cord injury, and I started to work with different populations, this was qualitative research that I did. So it was, we don't talk about generalizability, but it was transferable. When I talked to this mm. to other people, they identified with it and, and it touched them. 
And so, and, and when I talk to people, you know, in my daily life that don't have injuries or illness, you know, they're just having I'll call it boring or mundane tech lives, you know, and they, and they say, aha, yeah, this is, this is, this is what I'm missing, you know, yes, this, exactly this is what I need. Yes, exactly. So it's it, so it's actually you know it it, it can it can be a really a really beautiful thing like the silver lining in all of this is that because of the loss of sensation and because of the loss of you know easy easily accessible friction sex you kind of have to go deeper you have to go around it and find different avenues and so yeah. it kind of you know causes you to awaken these other sensory experiences which have potentially can be even more fulfilling. Absolutely. It just forces you. So I, I, I see like spinal cord injury or any kind of serious illness, illness or injury as a, as a developmental milestone. Yes. Right? And so you could go either way when you hit some kind of uh, milestone, right? So you could either, you know, we, we talk about post-traumatic stress with our, we hear it a lot with, with, with the military now, uh, but we don't hear a lot about post-traumatic growth. Yes. You know? So you know, you can go two ways, and, and, and we see time and time again, you know, I've been, you know, watching uh, a series uh, that the Wounded Warriors Project is doing, because I've been very involved with a seriously injured combat vets over the last seven or eight years, and, and you know, what I see in each story is the importance of the partner um, in these folks with very serious uh, injuries, whether they be brain injuries or, or, or multiple limb loss, uh, to 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 helping them move on with their lives, and and what we what we knew, what we were hearing in 2006, is that one of the leading causes of suicide uh, in the military were you know failed intimate relationships, and and that you know that's on top of you know the multiple deployments and all the other stress. But you know when they when they came down to their what we call root cause analysis, the the, the army. Uh, psychiatrist, chief psychiatrist was, you know, identifying failed intimate relationship, and it continues to be one of the major, you know, straws that breaks the camel's back. Can you share a little bit more about your work with the Wounded Warriors and what you're finding? Yes, I'd love to. Um, as I said, in two, I didn't say, in 2006, I started, I was invited uh, to be on a panel uh, at a, a a program called the Road to Recovery Conference, where there was a hundred plus families uh, brought to Disney World to learn about different uh, aspects of their life after serious injury, and, and you know they had forethought uh, to include a panel on sexuality, which turned out over the years to be one of the most you know attended uh, workshops. And so, you know, over the years depending on the nature of the war and where they were fighting, whether it was Iraq or Afghanistan, you know, we started seeing a lot of folks with burns and amputations and then more uh, penetrating head injuries and then more PTSD and then more combination bullet wounds and orthopedic injuries. Uh, and so, you know, people are coming home. Uh, I just did this conference again in, in December, and some of the people are injured 10 years uh, with both post-traumatic stress, um, sometimes mild brain injury, and serious physical disabilities, and their sexuality hadn't been addressed. So this yeah. conference was the first time that it had been addressed. So in 2008, after that first experience at the end of 2006, I was working at Morehouse School of Medicine for uh, former Surgeon General Dr. David Satcher, and he allowed me to create a uh, a sexual health program and disability and chronic condition and and let me focus on, you know, the current problem which was addressing the sexual health care needs of our 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 combat vets. Um, and so we held a, a conference in Washington DC and we brought people together from the VA and the Department of Defense and from uh, suicide prevention and from all basically public private uh, organizations and potential research organizations and funders to, to put our minds around and, and to put this issue of, of sexual health on the map, connecting sexual health with mental health and physical health and, and looking at it as an important component of quality life and, and of care. So over the years, you know, I continue to work with the Road to Recovery Conference. I worked with the VA here in um, 
in the southeast, I'll call it Vision 7, but which is called the southeast, uh, in developing uh, marriage enrichment. They're the cha- it's with chaplains and social workers, so they call it marriage enrichment uh, retreats, uh, but it's not only for people who are who are married, so we get people together and we work on uh, their their relationships, not specifically their sexual relationship, but we, we work on increasing their ability to um, be empathetic and vulnerable, which, you know, is, is a challenge after coming back. And Absolutely. so, you know, we do this by, we adapted a program called PEERS, which people could find online. It's called P-A-I-R-S, which is an acronym for Practical Applications of Intimate Relationship Skills. So we would work on their communication uh, around all these various issues, and then we would add, we would, you know, complement that, that peers curriculum with, with information on sexual health. Uh, and currently, you know, I'm working with, um, last year, we, me and colleagues worked with Walter Reed National Military Medical Center. Uh, they have a sexual health and intimacy work group, uh, uh, you know, a core group of about 18 people, but they brought us in to do training, and I trained for two days uh, about 100 uh, healthcare professionals within the, the Department of Defense on the provision of comprehensive sexual health care for seriously injured folks. And the core, wow. the core group received over the year about 90 hours of, of sexual health education. Uh, and this year, you know, um, God willing uh, and funding, you know, willing, uh, uh, we will work towards getting uh, core people in that group uh, certified through our American Association of Sexuality Educators, Counselors, and Therapists as either sex educators or, or or therapists. So, so you know, we're beginning to address this, uh, you know, through you know the official Department of Defense, through through the efforts of people at Walter Reed, and and through the efforts of some people throughout various places in in the VA system. So, you know, I've been an advocate for the inclusion of, of comprehensive sexual health care for, you know, over over 20 years. I wrote, I wrote a curriculum in 1994 funded by the Paralyzed Veterans of America for, for a spinal cord, and they have worked with that, like I said, to do all types of rehab and now have really just started a company called Emergo Health to focus on, you know, improving uh, patient satisfaction and outcomes through the provision of sexual health care. So, you know, now we're, I think the time has come where, you know, in the United States, the healthcare system is, you know, beginning to focus on patient-centered care and beginning to value with money, with either incentives and or fines, patient uh, experience and outcomes. So they're looking at patient satisfaction. And I'm making the argument that patient-centered care, you know, is, is, needs to be focused on sexuality because sexuality is at, at our core. So if we're not addressing sexuality and sexual health care, then we're not doing patient-centered care. Amen. I love it. So it's holistic. Mind, holistic. body, emotions, and sex. I love it. There's a huge gap. You know, doctors aren't asking, patients aren't asking, but it's important to patients. And you'll see in the research over and over again, doctors know it's important, but they don't know how to ask. They don't they know don't when know. they should ask. Patients, it's top on their mind, but they are embarrassed to ask. So yes. we want to close this gap, you know. Yes. So, I love it. I love it. Well, kudos worth, to you. Thank you. <laughs> so I do I do want to share, because we're getting close to the top of the hour, I, I do want to talk about your videos, because they are so uh, practical, so accessible, and I learned quite a bit watching them, and they're free on your on your website. So could you share a little bit about your website and why you created these videos? Sure. I'm really honored that you learned something, yeah, you know, as a, as a tantric educator yourself. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, you know, these videos were inspired by a, a project um, that the Christopher and Dana Reeves Foundation was doing. Um, so they were doing Reeves Health Minutes. And I was like, well, we should have health minutes on sexual health. And so originally I was developing them for, for them, but for some reason they got cold feet the last minute. Uh, and so, you know, uh, I'm giving it a plug, not because they paid me, but just because the Liberator Factory Outlet is here in Atlanta. And so they gave me the studio. They provided two cameramen and, and sound and editing so that I could follow through with this project. And so 
the the purpose of these things is to have actionable, demonstrable, and actionable little short educational pieces. So I, as someone in this area, you know, you said, your friend said, there's not a lot of stuff. I'm used to the same old stuff with myths about people with sex, people with disabilities are asexual or people aren't interested in sex or they're childlike. Those we've heard over and over a hundred times. Those aren't helpful for people. You know, the, this myth I told you are myths that are going on in their head. It's about us. Uh, it's not about myths society has for us. But, but I wanted to begin to develop a program that will help people kind of regain that feeling, find their way back so it doesn't take them 15 or 20 years. Yeah. So the formula that I developed is represented in these, these videos. So the first one, and they're not in order on the website, but if they were on a DVD, the first one in, in developing was the, the Tantra, Stop, Focus, and Connect. So we already talked about that. So it demonstrates, you know, basic Tantra techniques of breathing and sound and looking at each other. The next one goes to deal with, you know, sensate focus or touch. And so this is, you know, sensate focus is something that Masters and Johnson kind of promoted uh, in their work, and now people are watching the Masters of Sex, I guess, on on, on TV. Uh, but sensate focus was was something that was done to get in touch with, you know, get in touch with touch. <laughs> uh, and so there 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 there's a, a several minute um, video on on sensate focus, which is and very very. Which I want to interrupt is very, very sensual and very, very sweet, and I highly recommend it. And I want to thank Susan Kay for volunteering to sit in with me, and, and she's actually doing more of the educating. I'm just taking pleasure in making the video. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, I love my work. Uh, <laughs> so we go from the, the, the stop, focus, and connect to the touch, the physical touch, and, and the sensation. And then I get mm -hmm. into uh, the sexual positions for both men and women. And here, you know, when we were talking earlier, you know, disability forces us to be more creative, yeah. right? So it's about creativity, uh, and it's about um, having a, a sense of humor uh, and, and doing things in a, in a different way. And so the ones on sexual position uh, show, and it also focuses on positions for kind of lingus in, 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 the, in the sexual position uh, for men, uh, but it shows about using uh, pillows and wedges and, um, and alternatives to traditional missionary positions to be able to stay intimate and and engage in sexual activities, whether it be intercourse, oral or oral sex, or just touching, uh, even with paralysis. Uh, and, and I just want to say that comfort is important regardless of, of whether you have an injury or not. So I know it's primarily important and, and the way you demonstrated using the pillows are, is absolutely necessary. But one of the things we teach in Tantra is like, you know, like why be uncomfortable? Conventional sex, it's like, you know, the cunnilingus, you're going to have a crink in your neck and who wants right. to do that for an hour, right? So, so using the pillows and love bumpers and liberators and that kind of thing, it, it's practical and it makes sex better for everybody. Period. Yeah, and in, in one of the videos, the, the one for men, you know, I'm in my wheelchair sitting very comfortably on the side of the bed. Yeah. My partner in the video is propped up on the side of the bed. So, you know, I could do that for an hour if I, if I wanted to or she wanted to. Yeah. It's just, yes, exactly. Exactly. You, you know, so we basically, you know, I talk about minimizing pain and maximizing mobility. You know, and this is, you don't have to break your neck for this. It, so many people suffer from back pain or arthritis, right? Exactly. And so if you have back pain or joint pain, you need to do the same things. So we need to figure out in your daily life what hurts the last, least. You know, and if that means, you know, certain times of the day you have more energy, less pain. Uh, if you are on prescription medicines, uh, you want, might want to time them before your sexual activity so that, you know, that you're most comfortable at a time that you have your your best chance for success. Success. So and another myth in general is that you know sex is spontaneous. You know, uh, which is probably one of the biggest myths for everybody. You know, one of my professors, uh, Bill Staten, says you know sex was one of the most planned planned activities on the earth. That you know he knew that uh, you know you were going to have sex if you had a date. It was going to be on Friday night. You know, you're going to go to dinner and a movie, and it was after the movie and before you brought her home. 
So you have this like little window of time that you plan for all week, and, yeah. and we think that's spontaneous. So, uh, you know, the idea that sex has to be spontaneous, you just kind of get rid of that myth. And, and exactly. And, and that's the idea, and that's another thing that I share also is having sex dates, you know, and, and spontaneity is great, but it's, it's unreliable. Hence the word right. spontaneous, right? It's unreliable. So we are almost out of time, Mitch, and I would love it if you shared with our audience how they can get a hold of you and learn more about the work that you're doing and, uh, and, and watch these amazing videos. Sure, and I think you'll have these links on your website. So uh, to get in touch with me personally, I have MitchellTepper.com, M-I-T-C-H-E-L-L-T-E-P-P-E-R.com. And so I have... Uh, my contact information there, and the videos are there. And then, you know, for Emergo Health, which is focused more towards the healthcare industry, it's E M E R G O H E A L T H. And Emergo comes from emerge, from a Latin saying, saying I struggle and I emerge. Uh, and so the focus is, you know, beyond survival, uh, thriving. And you know, I just saw that. Similar quote, you know, um, uh, attributed or, you know, used by, um, I'm slipping on her name, who just passed away. Maya, Maya Angelou. Right. You know, yeah. I, I, I saw something on Facebook. I'm like, wow, you know, that's so similar. But, you know, that was uh, a term I used, uh, you know, for over 20 years, you know, beyond survival, thriving. When I, thriving. When I was on a Flourish, Flourish Corporation, another... Another idea. So, so MitchellTepper.com, EmergoHealth.com, uh, and you could get through. Most of their content is 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 housed at MitchellTepper.com. Wonderful. And so, I, just for you listeners out there, I'm going to post uh, all of this information, all of Mitchell's contact information, and the playback of his show on DaveyWard.me. So you can check it out and just click a link and head over to his website. I want to thank you so much. Dr. Tepper, for being here with us this evening and sharing your wisdom and your research and just your beauty and your glory. We really appreciate it. Thank you, and thank you for having me and spreading the word. It's very important. It is. It's so crucial and so important for all of us human beings. I want to thank everyone out there for listening this evening, for tuning in and joining us, and uh, stay tuned. See you next week.